What we're about to share with you is informed by the knowledge and understandings we've constructed as people who help produce and edit the AIGA Design Educators Community, or DEC, scholarly journal, Dialectic. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this journal, it's supported ideologically and financially by the AIGA DEC and is published by University of Michigan Publishing. If you're interested in learning more about Dialectic or reading some of its content or submitting a piece for possible publication, please visit us at our website. In our roles as journal co-editors, grant and conference submission reviewers, and as senior visual communication design faculty who have reviewed almost 80 design-rooted university-level faculty candidates for tenure and promotion in the U.S., we have had many opportunities to critically read a diverse amalgam of scholarly writing, research reports, criticism, case studies, tenure dossiers, and grant proposals. We are drawing from the knowledge and understandings we have cultivated from engaging in these experiences to inform what we will impart in this short presentation. What is on offer here is not a formula or a set of algorithms that, if followed exactly and in sequence, is guaranteed to ensure the publication of your work in well-respected, peer-reviewed scholarly venues. It is rather intended as a set of guidelines that will hopefully prove to be, more or less, equal parts practically useful and constructive for those newly facing the challenges inherent in attempting to publish their research and scholarship in and around design education in reputable publications, as well as those who have accrued at least some experience doing this, but who are hoping to broaden their knowledge of and about these processes. We are not alone as journal editors and producers working in and around design not to mention a myriad of other disciplines who repeatedly receive passionately worded, zealously recounted descriptions of some instance of what the author purports to be a novel teaching approach, methodology or method, or the outcomes of planning and operating these. These pieces tend to be supported by examples of student work or documentation of a participatory project that involved a population or a community in need or both. Simply put, these kinds of pieces can be described as, quote, I developed and operated a process that seemed cool to me and then to my students and our collaborators and then it actually turned out to be really cool and the students learned a great deal and our collaborators were really happy with the outcomes the end." Unquote. In this type of writing, the authors tend to avoid engaging in effective argumentation, which involves using well-articulated rationales for suggesting or doing something or for drawing inferences or conclusions that are well supported by some type of actual evidence. In this context, Rationales and evidence can be the results of the author's own research findings based on his, her, or their documentation of the testing of a prototype, or a process for making or doing, or the operation of a particular agenda. Merely informing an individual, like the reader of a journal, or an audience, that an action has been taken or an assignment has been delivered should not be equated with offering clearly articulated combinations of rationales and evidence. And lest anyone forget, these clearly articulated combinations of rationales and evidence are the two primary ingredients needed to fuel effective argumentation. Dialectic accepts submissions for publication across seven categories for scholarly writing and one category for visual narratives or essays. 
The seven categories of scholarly writing that we accept are one of three basic types. The position paper, the research paper, and the critical review. Our visual narrative or visual essay category accommodates submissions that are primarily comprised of visual imagery, like photographs or illustrations or some combinations of these that work together to facilitate some type of visual storytelling. Each visual narrative we publish must be accompanied by about a thousand words of prose that provides our readers with some well-crafted insights about why it was designed and how it either aligns with or counters a specific social, cultural, environmental, or political context. We have also had occasion to review a plethora of research papers and project summaries over the past couple of decades that are beset by similar flaws. They articulate what was developed, formulated, and performed to yield results from a single project, event, or operation, often with a relatively small and narrowly constituted end group. They are written as if almost no one else has ever thought to engage in this type of research before. So no, or very little, mention is made in the writing of where the endeavor is located or situated in the canon or landscape of other research that has been conducted in or around this area previously. These pieces are often presented as one-offs. I engaged in this singularly focused research project and here are my results without any or often not nearly enough contextualization, failing to effectively reference the work of others who have engaged in work similar to what is on offer in a given submission, tends to indicate that the submission's authors are also failing to provide evidence to support whatever approaches, rationales, and processes are being described in the writing. Additionally, failing to effectively reference the work of others who have engaged in research, practice, or scholarship that could inform and contextualize the contents of a given submission tends to cause most reviewers to recommend against publication or funding. The people whose last names appear on this slide have become well known in the design education, research, and practice communities for publishing their scholarship regarding particular subject or topic areas. So, if you're writing about a research project you've been engaged in that involves participatory design, you should read at least some of the work published about this by Liz Sanders and Peter Stappers, and then cite key aspects of what they've published in your writing. If you're writing about issues that involve aspects of user experience design or human-computer interaction, you should read at least some of the work about this published by Bill Mogridge and Don Norman and then cite key aspects of what they've published. With regard to both of the problematic types of writing described above, the lack of effective contextualization usually means that some crucial questions that should have been defined and addressed prior to attempting either the novel teaching approach, methodology or method, or the research project were ignored or simply not even conceived or considered. These include the following three questions, stated somewhat broadly to encompass a wide variety of situations. First, was the teaching innovation or research project informed by a specific extant approach and methodology, and if so, hopefully yes, which ones and why? Second, what were or are the objectives and goals, not the same things, of the teaching innovation or research project? And finally, what suppositions or hypotheses were tested during the operation of the teaching innovation or the research project, and why these in particular? Others include what methods guided the process of whatever was operationalized, and why were these utilized? 
or what data was yielded, and what did the author's analysis of this data reveal? Or what evidence has your engagement in these endeavors produced that could be used to support one or more rationales to improve design education to guide future design decision making? And is the research project or teaching innovation generalizable, that is, applicable or adaptable to other contexts or situations in some way? And if so, why? Or if not, why not? Every submission for possible publication that Dialectic receives undergoes a rigorously facilitated critical review process that is fairly standard across academic and professional disciplines as diverse as engineering, economics, chemistry, and philosophy. This process begins with a desk review, which starts with one to three members of an editorial team engaging in a preliminary read of whatever has been submitted to ensure that it meets what we refer to as our logistical criteria. Word counts must be adhered to, not too many, not too few. The document itself must be formatted according to the publication's specifications, and the piece must be written according to the guidelines specified in the Chicago Manual of Style. Specific journals and periodicals require most of their prose to be written according to a particular style manual, such as APA, the American Psychological Association, MLA, the Modern Language Association, or CMS, the Chicago Manual of Style. Once it has been determined that our logistical criteria have been met during the desk review process, an assessment of the organizational structure of the piece is coupled with an evaluation of its phrase-to-phrase, sentence-to-sentence, and paragraph-to-paragraph -paragraph writing style. This is the phase of our editorial process during which roughly half of the submissions Dialectic receives are removed from consideration for publication. We use a method that we have come to call the Bell Test to determine whether or not we should advance a given submission onto a group of three or four external reviewers to engage in what is known as the double-blind review process. The Bell Test involves the writer of X piece of prose sitting at a table with three others who are unfamiliar with this prose and a concierge bell. A Bell Test session begins by having one person at the table read X piece of prose aloud while the others actively listen. No one at the table should read their own prose aloud. In other words, this means that anyone sitting at the table can read anyone else's prose. As soon as anyone sitting at the table hears anything that doesn't quite make sense or doesn't work, they must ring the concierge bell. Whoever rings this bell must concisely and clearly explain why he, she, or they chose to ring it. The author of X piece of prose then records whatever the bell ringer says in writing. Finally, it is up to the person who had their bell rung to use the critical commentary offered by the bell ringer to improve his, her, or their prose. What follows is an articulation of the nine most common reasons submissions are rejected during the Bell test process. Number one, the phrase-to-phrase, sentence-to-sentence, and paragraph-to-paragraph -paragraph use of prose in the piece are flawed grammatically or syntactically or otherwise inhibit the effective readability of the piece. This is, unfortunately, an incredibly common problem. We have received a large volume of submissions that make it apparent that those who wrote them are unfamiliar with the simple but effective instructions for clear and concise writing articulated in Strunk and White's easy to read and utilize book, Elements of Style, or the somewhat more in-depth book, 
Stylish Academic Writing by Helen Sword. Number two, the authors don't clearly state a thesis or essential argument or raison d'etre at the outset of their piece, which entails a clear articulation of not only what the piece is about, but why it would be worth a reader's precious time and energy to read its contents. Number three, authors fail to situate how what they're offering or writing about fits into and differs from the larger context of scholarship that's already been created around the examination of the topics of their piece. Number four, the authors make key claims in the piece that are unsupported by evidence or well-argued rationales. Number five, the essential argumentative structure of the piece is poorly constructed and organized. Number six, authors fail to clearly articulate meaningful or viable conclusions or effectively crafted summations or calls for further types of research at the culmination of their submissions. Number seven, the authors delve into details or get sidetracked in one or more areas of their narrative in ways that confuse their central theme or main message. Number eight, the piece has been written in a manner that assumes the reader possesses extant knowledge of whatever is being articulated or explained, so much so that crucial explanatory or contextually relevant information is left out. And finally, number nine, the authors use unnecessary or inappropriate jargon or purposefully obscure or use difficult language in an attempt to make their submission seem rigorous or serious. Only after a submission has been assessed to be worthy of further evaluation during the Bell test review process does it advance to the next phase during which it is read and analyzed more deeply by between two and four reviewers who have expertise in the subject matter that constitutes the submission. It is these reviewers who offer more probative critical commentary in writing to the authors of the submission so that they may execute whatever revisions, omissions, and augmentations that are called for by the external reviewers to ensure that it can eventually be published. Once these final alterations have been made, it is up to the managing editors of a given journal to decide whether to publish it or not. If, at this point, the piece is assessed to still need extensive rewriting, many journals will reject it, as they cannot afford to incur the time delay or the expense that rewriting may require at this juncture in the process. The need for more American graduate level design programs to immerse students in learning experiences that challenge them to write better is a topic that requires a more broadly informed and deeply probative inquiry than can be articulated in this discourse. What is on offer in this closing section of the piece is a brief diatribe on the negative ramifications of this set of circumstances along with the means to enact two ideas that have the potential to positively alter the negative effects of this. The key concept to understand here is that this shortcoming directly contributes to a large number of people embarking on careers in design education, management, or thought leadership who are ill-equipped to effectively meet one of the primary challenges endemic to all of these. They all require knowing how to structure and support essential arguments and rationales with evidence articulated in effectively communicative prose, as well as how to clearly express why particular types of data analyses were used to affect specific design decisions and ultimately knowing how to convey these in text that is consistently engaging. Doing these things well helps ensure that what a given design educator, manager, or thought leader has done can be validated in some way as attempts are made to advance whatever initiatives they have formulated and operated. It also helps ensure 
that the outcomes of various types of design strategies and decision making can be effectively assessed by means other than someone's intuitively rooted assertion that whatever was undertaken worked well or failed to. Not being able to craft effective scholarly writing restricts too many critical conversations about design and its effects on social, technological, environmental, economic, and public policy change to being constrained within the realm of how rather than expanding into the realm of the why. It also often prevents designers from being able to collaborate effectively with others from outside of our discipline who possess the abilities and the cores of knowledge necessary to do this well and who are accustomed to having to express the significance of and providing validation for their work by means of writing well and then publishing what they have written. One of the central reasons offered in the previous section as to why articles often fail to advance beyond the desk review phase of the assessment process of dialectic and other scholarly journals was that they are judged to be not worth a reader's precious time and attention to read. They may also be rejected because they are assessed as not making a significant enough contribution of new knowledge and understanding to the discipline, like design and the research, scholarship, and educational endeavors that support it, within which a given journal is embedded. A way to help ensure that both of these objectives are effectively met is for the would-be authors of and about design research and scholarship to work with an experienced editor of scholarly prose from the earliest stages of their writing development processes. Effective editors will ask well-framed, broadly informed, deeply probative questions about why you have chosen to write about what you have, why you have chosen to operate whatever viewpoints or editorial stances you have, why you have chosen to structure your piece as you have, and why what you are writing about should be worth your intended readership's precious time. Effective editors of the type of prose that dialectic and other scholarly journals publish charge reasonable rates per hour or per the number of words they have to assess. And what you will spend to gain their wise counsel early on will more than make up for what you risk losing with a rejection or a sizable rewriting task that could have been avoided if it had been attended to earlier in the process. Finally, one of the aspects of co-producing and co-managing dialectic that has surprised us the most is, frankly, how taken aback or otherwise put off so many would-be authors from the realm of design and design education are when they are informed that their work has been deemed unacceptable for publication based on the criteria described earlier in this piece. Many have reacted with a kind of insulted incredulity when informed that their research approach does not effectively account for or locate itself within other similar research endeavors that have preceded it or that their line-by-line -line prose is not suitable for scholarly publication, or that what may be incredibly important scholarship in their personal estimation has not been deemed all that important to our readership according to whatever group of peer reviewers assess their submission. Our sense of why those who have been taken aback by dialectics rejection of their work is more than any other single factor attributable to something that I first heard voiced by a now former design-based scholarly journal editor more than 25 years ago at a Graphic Design Education Association or GDEA academic conference hosted by the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. As we were standing in line for drinks discussing some then recently published books on design research and education, she offered, far too many designers and design educators don't read critically, don't know how to read critically, and aren't particularly interested in reading critically. 
This editor's blunt words weren't so much a condemnation of designers and design educators, but in her experience-based opinion, not knowing how to read or wanting to read in ways that ensured that the act of reading itself played an actual role in not only the discovery of new knowledge, but in the construction of it, the latter of which tends to require broadly informed critical thinking and a willingness to question information presented as facts.